Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for joining uh, this talk here. So, um, so Nicolo and myself were asked to give a, a talk together on our recent papers on uh, cobotism, K-theory and tadpoles. And uh, unavoidably, it overlaps a bit with the talk we gave recently at the Madrid meeting. Um, so, but we distributed it a bit differently. So what I will just do as the senior <laughs> collaborator here, uh, so I will just give a more general introduction to the topic and slightly review this older paper. Here the one. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, so I will review um, this paper with, uh, with Nicolo uh, from last year and point towards the questions that we are about to address in this uh, two uh, upcoming papers that were upcoming this year. And this is what, then what uh, Nicolou will essentially talk about. So why can I, ah, here we go. Sorry for that. Okay, so let me <clears throat> just uh, introduce uh, Kobodism. So you all know that there is this uh, swapping conjecture that there should be no global symmetries in any theory of quantum gravity. And if one seems to detect one, uh, it actually needs to be gauged or broken. These are the two uh, solutions that we have. I mean, just to bring you on the page. So for con continuous symmetry, this means that either if we have a preserved current, uh, this current appears on the right-hand side of an equation of motion or Bianchi identity, depending on the taste, whether you would like to use magnetic or electric uh, variables. So this the gauging. So you introduce extra fields. So that, that open integration on a compact manifold, only, only the zero charge will survive. Or the other way is just to break the current such that it's not any longer preserved so that you get an object here in N plus one form on the right-hand side so that it's just uh, broken. Um, and the non-vanishing cobalt, I mean, this is the main point of this uh, famous paper or very important paper by McNamara and Waffer is to point out that also non-vanishing cobaltism groups are a source of global symmetry, and thus they need to be nullified eventually in any consistent theory uh, of gravity. So when you detect a non-vanishing um, cobordism group, this just tells you that you haven't used yet the right structure, so to say, in which you have computed that. So you should improve. And the physics point of view here, gauging and breaking, tells you sort of the two directions which you should improve your, your, uh, your structure group here in order to nullify it. Then in that paper, they discussed, in fact, many examples based on cobordism groups that were known to be non-vanishing and that the mathematicians have computed. And that seemed to be relevant for particular for supersymmetric theories and for fermionic theories. And these are the cobordism groups uh, with structure spin or spin C. I will come to that in a moment. <clears throat> and then they made proposals mainly which defects can break these global symmetries in, in say type 2b theory or an f theory and so on. There was also a more recent um, development by a colleague here, Dieter Lust, and some of his students um, about uh, applying cobordism um, to, to the rich flow conjecture that they had. Okay, so what, what are cobordisms? So first of all, you, you, you fix the structure and here there's this index N. So this tells you that you should look for equivalence classes of N-dimensional, in this case now, spin manifolds, where these manifolds are, are known to be, or are, are, are called to be equivalent if they are at the boundary of a one-dimensional higher manifold uh, W here, such that the boundary of W is precisely M uh, the disjoint union with n bar. n bar here means the other orientation. So I'm looking at oriented manifolds here, of course, for spin manifolds. So that's an equivalence um, relation. And then you can mod out by this, and this defines your, uh, your cobordism groups. And there is a detail in it. You can show that this is a group, and you can define an addition, which is uh, if you have two of these uh, groups and some representatives m and n, you just take the disjoint union of them. Um, so these structures also appeared, I should mention before, in this work, for instance, by Estebari and Montero in the, in the framework of Diefried anomalies. Important for our talk here is that there is a slight generalization of this picture, uh, where you also specify not only the dimension and, and the structure, but, but also a background manifold X. Um, so these are called cubism groups relative to X. And, and what the additional structure there is, is that you fix a background X here, and you also have from your um, 
manifolds M and M, you have some maps of M into this background manifold. And then, so to say, um, these maps also have to um, behave properly upon taking this cobordism. Uh, so there should be an extension of these maps to the interior W such that if you, when you restrict it to the boundary, they become F and G. So that's the picture. And the, the, the case I was telling you before is just the, the trivial case when you choose X to be the point. So this looks a bit more, so what we are doing now here is we introduce again backgrounds that we thought we would better get rid of, so make it more background independent. But we will see that nevertheless, since this is a nice mathematical definition and many things are known about this, just to understand what these cobordisms are about and what we can do with that, it's nevertheless useful to go in some sense one step back from the actual aim to make a background independent theory and introduce backgrounds again into the theory. It's, sorry, Ralph, can you explain yeah. in what sense X should be viewed as a background? You're looking at the map from M to X. They don't even yeah, have well, I, I call it the background. That's more, more stringy. Uh, wording, I would say, but it's fixed. So if you define these groups for a fixed background X. This is all what I mean. But what, what is the physics motivation? I'm missing the physics motivation. Well, the physics motivation, I think, will come. OK. Yeah. So this is just mathematicians have defined these things. Um, they are more refined, as you will see. So you get even more, you get even larger, larger uh, symmetry, uh, symmetry groups then, and you have a harder time even to break them. But it's just to bring to see what's going on and to bring order into the concepts that we have, that we were looking into these. But and the dimension and, of X can be bigger than N, for example? Yes, it can be bigger than N. I mean, you choose X to have a fixed dimension, say, and then you can define omega N for all values of N. X could be 100 dimensional, for example. For instance, could, in particular, could be lower than uh, X. OK. Lower than the dimension of X. OK, I would love to hear the physics motivation. I'll let you go on. Yeah. So, uh, Ralph, can I, can I ask a perhaps related question? So. One example of these cobordism groups, which happens, you know, have, has been discussed a lot also in the physics literature, is when you take X to be infinite dimensional and to be a classifying space. Yes, yes. Of some group. So that gives you gauge boundary. Is that going to be part of the of the story? Well, this or? is what do, but this is not what we will do. So we will okay. really looking at X as the backgrounds where you usually compactify string theory on Calabi-Yau K3 toroidal spaces. This is what we had in mind. Just wait a bit. The motivation is not might not be clear yet, but I just tell you the mathematicians have defined these things. People have done physics with this case where X is a point, and now we would like to see later on what will happen if we go away from the point case and try to understand that. Okay, so the but here I'm more mostly reporting again what we did in this first paper, which was for the case that X is a point, yeah, like in the original work by by Kumrum. And Jacob and um, so our our work, so to say, starts with an observation that we did for ourselves, which is of course, as you will see, known in the mathematics literature. So, in particular, when you look at at the structure spin, and so in this case, uh, uh, the spin cobordism groups are actually for the first uh, dimensions here are actually known, and here's a list of them. Uh, this is a well-known table. It's also contained in the original paper by Krumum and uh, Jacob. And here are the generators of them, so representatives who generate, so to say, the unique elements in these uh, non-vanishing groups. And if you would ignore this factor square here for dimension eight, and you look at these numbers, these are actually the same numbers that you find in the table for the KO uh, K-theory groups. And we know that the KO K-theory groups, they classify uh, D-brains in type one string theory. That's our observation, and this extends actually to the case when you have, when the structure is spin C, where all odd classes are vanishing, and you get only factors that are that are uh, so to say uh, in Z in the integers itself. So no discrete things here. Oh, sorry. And um, again, you have this table, and you get multiplicities at higher orders here. But if you ignore these multiplicities, this is precisely the same as 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 the complex K theory groups. That people have defined, which are known to classify D brains in string theory. Excuse me. I heard some noise. Sorry. Okay. Good. So um, this is our observation. In this case, also here in principle, but here this is more easy to explicitly write it down. And one can define. I mean, if you have a certain factor here, like C square, for instance, then you can also find two independent um, cobordism invariants. And these are, at least for low values here, are explicitly known. 
And for instance, for this BNC, my first BNC, they are generically known. They are generated by C1 and the Pontryagin classes and take all formal products of them. And for the first few numbers here, you can express them in terms, what I did here in terms of the top class and some powers of C1. This is all what remains. Okay, so this is just an observation, which is intriguing. And well, of course, people should have noticed and they have. Uh, so the mathematicians know about this relationship. So indeed there exists an intricate mathematical relationship between K theory and cobordism. And so what we were asking ourselves sort of is the question, what is the phys physical significance of it? How does it fit into this cobordism conjecture of Kumrum and, and, and Jacob? And so this goes under the name initially of the Atiyah bot Shapiro map. So this tells you that mathematically there exists a ring homomorphism from the spin C cobaltism groups um, to the complex K theory groups. And similarly uh, for the spin cobaltism groups to the KO K theory groups. And when restricted to a fixed grade, these maps can be explicitly given and they are given for spin C in terms of the top class. And for, I guess a little typo, this C should be gone here. Uh, and, and for spin, uh, in terms of a generalization, I would say of the A-roof of the A-roof genus. Yeah. Um, so, and in particular, these things are cobalt and invariants that should better be. And we have seen the Todd class already appearing in, in the table. And I can also show that this map is subjective so that one can divide by its kernel and even get an isomorphism. Yeah between the two things. Okay, so, so what we see, and moreover, if you just compute K-theory classes, so these are, these are known in string theory to classify D-brains, right? Um, so um, if you are not, if you are ignoring the gauge fields, so if you're just computing charges by K-theory groups, you're also computing global charges, of course. So this means that both K-theory and cobordisms compute global charges. And for K-theory, um, these global, global symmetries are all expected to be gauged. So what will happen, so this is our proposal essentially. So for non-torsion classes, this leads to Bayanke identities of the, of the usual form. No? So you, you have your, your sources, the D-brain sources, you can write you know, as, as some uh, by Poincaré duality. So a D-brain wrapping a certain cycle by Poincaré duality you can map it to an N-form, say, and then you gauge it. So on the left-hand side, you introduce, in this case, here some magnetic gauge fields as such that the Bianchi identity is of this form. So this is what you would do if you gauge uh, K-theory classes. And the proposal is that the missing geometric piece that, you, that we know exists in string theory here is described by the corresponding K-theory groups, or more precisely, by a linear combination of the cobordism invariants appearing here on the right-hand side. So if you would turn the logic around, so in string theory, we know there are these tadpole, these are usually called tadpole cancellation conditions. So the right-hand sides of the Bianchi identity. If you turn off the gauge field, so you get various global charges. You get a set of global charges for the brains themselves. These are classified by K-theory. And then you get global charges that are related to these other geometric things that are appearing on the right-hand side usually. And these are classified then by, by cobordisms. So the claim is that in certain cases, that these, these two things really belong together. Yeah. Um, right. So as I said, so in string theory, this is our, our, our proposal that these cobordism classes describe the geometric contribution, in particular in type one for the KO groups and type 2 B or antifold or F theory tempo constraints. And this you can check for a number. Of, so we have a lot of checks in, in our paper. So we discussed a couple of examples. So let's look for, first for the more easy case for the spin C cobordism, which means the complex K theory classes. So in this case, um, we have the Todd class. This is, this is always there. This is the natural current. This makes the Atiyah bot Shapiro. Uh, map, so homomorphism, so um, these are the natural currents to, to appear on the right-hand side of these tadpole constraints of these gaugings. Uh, but this is only one of them, as we have seen, in, in general, we have a proliferance of z-factors in higher cobordism classes, and we have more cobordism invariants. So first to, first to see whether all of them appear maybe, or what is their interpretation. And for that purpose, we looked uh, at a number of examples. 
So first Montreal example is omega two, spin C. Here the cobalt is invariant is just a third class, second third class, oops, which is uh, proportional to the first chunk class over two. So, and if you, if you write this on the right-hand side of this gauging and you also include the, the sources, so you introduce uh, a magnetic one form in this case. So you, you have here your D7 brains in that case, which are classified by K2 yeah, of the point. And on the right-hand side, you get this, this is C1. So if you look at this carefully, this is nothing else than the usual F-theory constraint in eight dimensions. Yeah? Where this factor of 24 here is really put in by hand. So, so far we have no way to fix it, so to say, a priori, also by just cobordism or K-theory uh, notion, say, or, or the structure itself. So this was one example. Uh, maybe just a, a, a comment yes. on that factor of 24. It, isn't that fixed by, um, by duality symmetry? To what? Uh, if, if you if you assume that the, the type 2b theory is invariant under the Miguel can fill in the words, the proper yes, double, double cover or multiple cover of SL2z, yes. then, and then you start computing bordism of, of that, um, I think it fixes that to be to be 24. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Miguel can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so I think I think so it's not bordism of SL2z, you need to do bordism of analytic vibration. But uh, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, but that would be nice to figure out in general, so to say, what is the rule of what numbers do appear in these uh, in these gaugings uh, when you gauge K theory classes and cobordism at the same time. So here, I mean, if you if you're having a solution, that's fine to hear, and uh, would be eager to hear more. I, I think if I, I mean, can, we had this, I mean, uh, you know, we had this discussion, right, uh, Miguel, <laughs> in the past, so. Yes, so I was just going to say that uh, that uh, indeed, uh, but uh, Jake is on something because so th this number is different in different theories, but these different theories have different duality groups. So it makes yeah. sense that in one you can fix the 24 and in others uh, you yeah. fix it sometimes. Yeah. Is this number, sorry to have a, a, a sidebar, but Miguel, is this number different in your new string theory, your new moduli space? It, it, it's the same as, as the, all, the ones that we already knew in rank one. I see, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, then no, I continue. So the next case, or the next interesting case is if you look also again at spin C cobalism groups, uh, this time omega six, so six manifolds, this was Z plus Z. And here, if you just write the naive gauging, so to say, according to our rules, so you, you include here um, the world volume of the three brains um, and, and, and the two cobalism invariants that we have. So the first one is the Todd class again. The second one, as I shown you in this table, was C1 to the third power over two. And we leave for the moment these prefactors free here. Then you can realize for an appropriate choice of these numbers, namely minus 12 and minus 30, um, and choosing M, this manifold M, to be uh, the base of a smooth elliptically fibered Calabria fourfold, you reproduce the, the known D3 brain tadpole cancellation F theory. Uh, which is of this form, so you can write the Euler number precisely in terms of these two invariants. So the point here is that it really contains precisely the two cobordism invariants of the spin C group, which is the tot six class and C one third over two. In particular, uh, there's no no C three term, and C three is also not a cobordism invariant for, of spin C. And moreover, what else we can say? So you can ask, okay, so what, what is then the distinguished property, say, of when, when does the, only the Todd class, so to say, appear? Because the Todd class is the one that appeared in the ABS lab. So what is, what is distinguishing it, so to say? And one proposal is here that, um, so that this, so this piece would be gone if you would have a, a background where you only have sort of smeared or geometrized or three planes, but no O7 planes present. So, and then you can find an example uh, by looking at a certain um, look at a, at a certain orientifold of K3 times T2 over omega times the Z2 uh, um, involution. 
such that there are only O3 planes. So you let this evolution act freely on the K3. We have this in the paper. And then you look at the downstairs geometry, so to say. So you take this quotient. So since there are no fixed points, it smooths. And you find that you, it's, it's, you have a certain candidate, so to say. So when only the Todd class should really appear, because now you have a candidate for a manifold that only has O3 planes. And this comes out to be DP9 cross P1. And if you, if indeed, if you compute this invariance for this manifold, you find that the Todd class is one and this friend here is zero. So this gives us some credence uh, to, um, to our argument that this term, the Todd class indicates is the contribution, so to say, from, a, from just pure O3 brains or smeared out O3, 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 sorry, O3 planes or smeared out O3 planes if you geometrize them. So that's our point of view. And so what else? So you could do, play the same game um, with the spin cobalt as well, but here a new aspect appears. This is the one when, when you have this uh, torsion group here, like for instance, KO as one is the same as omega one spin, which is C2. So we are tempted that to write down a C2 value charge neutrality condition in this case, which would, like, would look like this. So here you have uh, non-BP SD8 brains being the objects charged um, under this K-theory groups. Group, excuse me. And so this is uh, this invariant is known here for, for omega one spin. And so the question is again is what is the value of K? Of course, it's only a, should only be a mod two condition because everything is just defined mod two. So if K is even or would be even, then you can observe that the right hand side would immediately decouple because it's always even. Um, in this case, it would just purely be the, the K theory charge which is gauged. And, and the Z2 from the Kobolism group would still be there. So it needs to be broken by some seven brain defects, for instance. If K is odd, this is a, would be a strange situation because then a single non bp 8 brain on the background S1 would be charged neutral and allowed, even though you expect that S1 is a consistent compactification of the type one string without the non bp 8 brain. So this, I think we think points to the, the direction that K should better be even so that these two things decoupled here. And then the question is whether this is just the case for this very specific case or whether this is a generic uh, situation for torsion charges that they essentially decouple, that you have your tadpole constraint for your K-theory charges and then the cobalism groups will all be broken. But we don't know that yet. So, 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 so Raf, to see if I understand. So what you're proposing is that there's kind of like a dichotomy. The the um, the torsion charges decouple the integer valued ones. In the examples that we've seen, they don't. Would, would they that don't. Be yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Okay. So I maybe we can talk about this later. But I yeah. thought that, for instance, it's something that I always found puzzling in the SO16 SO16 string. Uh -huh. um, the, um, the the second pondering class, which is a, 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 an integer cohomology class could have appeared in the tadpole, and it actually doesn't. Uh, and this is the only string theory that I know like that. OK. Well, at that example, we haven't looked at. So, but maybe talk about this. Uh, yeah, yeah like, it just, just came to mind because yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it always stood out to me as weird. As special, yeah. Get it. OK, so then moving forward and to, to join the next talk by the, the part by, uh, by Nicolo. So as we said, we have two ways uh, of getting rid of global symmetries. One is breaking, one is gauging. So in this respect, we were essentially asking two questions. So one is very closely related <clears throat> to this idea of dynamical cobordisms introduced by the Madrid group. They had a couple of we think, nice papers where you not only look at topological things, so really in the string theory literature, there were solutions known to some effective, say, dilaton gravity actions that looked strange at first sight because they had some singularities, but in particular, they had precisely these end of the world brains or at least singularities at some end of the world, finite size end of the world. Um, that, that is precisely of the type that you would uh, think should be present as a defect in order, in order to break the, uh, the cobordism group. Yeah, this is of co-dimension one always. Um, and there are precise solutions known. One is the dudas Mura solution, for instance. And then they were making a proposal how uh, the behavior close to this end of the world brains that you need to, so to say, to introduce to close off this singular, singular solution, uh, how, 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 how certain fields behave when you come close to, to, to this end of the world brains. And what we were looking at, uh, based on a former paper I, I wrote with Anna Maria Font from 2000. Uh, 
two, I think, from, two, from the year 2000, is we were even looking for uh, end of the world brains of higher co-dimension. So Nicolo will talk about this in a moment. And we were moving one step forward in the sense that we were not indirectly only detecting these end of the world brains by some solutions one founds and then one sees this finite interval and there should be something at the end. But you could also ask, are there sort of super gravity descriptions of these end of the world brains themselves? And for this, we found uh, at least in this, this example, a positive uh, answer. And the new quality, so to say, is that these solutions are non-isotropic, yeah, as Nicolo will show in a moment. And the second um, thing we were looking at in this, in this more extensive paper here from, from August is precisely we were looking in more detail uh, to the cases when, when we have these um, spaces X, where we define cobordism classes relative to a fixed manifold X, because this isomorphism that we have between spin and K theory and spin C and, and so K O theory and spin C and K theory, this extends also to this case. So this is the generalization of a classic theorem by Connor and Floyd. And so clearly it involves this more general, general cobordism classes with the space X here and similar the K theory classes. I mean, these guys are known to classify D brains on a background, literary background string, background string manifold X. So then the question is, so what do these things have in common? So how to compute these classes in the first place? And do they have any physical relevance in the swamp plan program? And that's the second kind of question we were asking. And, and Nicolo will now also address that hopefully. And so that is all I wanted to tell you and, and more details will follow now in the talk by Nicolo. Should I stop now? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's best if you stop sharing. Yeah, I think there's not, a, and there's not a really a break. And have have so all general questions at the end. Yeah, Unless yeah. there is, of course, any question right now, but uh, otherwise. Yeah, but some questions probably questions. only make sense when you have seen the full talk. <laughs> because I was giving it just an outlook. Yeah. yeah, so let's continue. OK, so thank you. Thanks, uh, the organizer, for the invitation. And thanks, Ralph, for the nice summary. Uh, so just to, to recap, what we've seen, I mean, the, the starting point for this investigation is the nice work by McNamara and Waffa, where they point out that cobordism has something to do in quantum gravity with global symmetries. The main, one of the main challenges in, in, in this conjecture is really to understand what is the quantum gravity structure, which is not known a priori. We have a proposal for a possible good direction indicated by the Whitehead Tower in this paper, but I will not really talk about this. Rather, I will uh, give more examples of what Ralph said. In particular, I will give a concrete example of a case in which when breaking uh, cobordism, you can predict indeed a new defect. And then uh, for the greater part of the talk, I will concentrate on, again, engaging cobordism together with a theory. In particular, uh, to the generalization of what Ralph said to the case in which we have a fixed manifold X. And in this kind of investigations, the, really the ultimate goal would be really to fully reconstruct the full current entering a tuple without any string theory information. In case this can be done, then this could be a possible way to give further support to the so-called string land post principle, because we would uh, derive uh, essentially a string theory Bianchi identity without using string theory. Okay, so uh, with the first example about breaking cobordism, I will just we really discuss a very specific situation, which is that of dynamical cobordism, which is a, a, a setup, a proposal by the group in Madrid. And essentially, the logic is to intertwine uh, the cobordism conjecture itself with the dynamic of the scalar field. So, in, in gravity, in quantum gravity, we typically have scalar fields. And then the idea is really to connect these two features. So, if you want to connect also cobordism conjecture with distance conjecture somehow. What happens in these setups is that there is a, a scalar potential which is driving scalar fields to infinity in, in the field space or modular space. So there is an infinite distance D in field space, while other, on the other hand, I have a finite space time distance in these compatifications. And actually, the defining properties of what, uh, what is called dynamical cobordism are really these scaling relations between the space-time distance and the space-time scalar to with the, the 
moduli, modular space distance t. Here, delta is a parameter order one, and which is also model dependent. It can be computed in specific models. What happens then, what is predicted, if you want, by dynamical cobordism is that at the endpoints of this finite space-time interval, there should be defects, which are predicted by the cobordism conjecture, which needs, which are needed to cancel the, the global sim, the global cobordism symmetry. So this is the generic setup. If you want, uh, there is a, I have a picture of this kind. So there is a finite space-time interval with endpoints, some defects. And on the, on the other end, the field space, there is some scalar field, which is diverging uh, into the limit. I also put here a circle because in the model we constructed, we studied uh, the concrete model, we have a circle compatification beside the interval, but okay, this is just a feature of our model. Okay, so uh, dynamical cobordism is not so exotic ex as it might seem. There are examples in the literature, for example, 10D massive that way is an example. Also, a non-supersymmetric 10-dimensional string theory, usually in, uh, called the Sugimoto model, which is a, uh, an oriented flow of type 2B, is another example. And there are more examples discussed in the papers by the group in Madrid. As I said, what we have done is that we provided yet a new uh, example, which is based on, uh, on this T-dual version of the Sugimoto model. So we worked in type 2A instead of type 2B. We reanalyzed already the solution presented by Blue and Hagen font, which presented two singularities at the endpoints of the interval. And then since cobordism is telling us that these singularities have to be seven brains, we tried to find a seven brain solution directly in supergravity and we su succeed. So the system we look at is a really a tapped way uh, with anti d eight planes. Uh, the back reaction was already computed. And in particular, this system admits a circle compatification. So we have a circle in the theory. This is why we look at omega one spin, spin because in general, we, we, we like to have fermions in the theory. This group has a Z to symmetry, so it must be broken, we think, by echo dimension to object, which is a seven brain. And the surprise, if you want, is that supergravity, somehow, so really a classical theory, can already give you some intuition of what this seven brain is. And this is a priori uh, not guaranteed. So we um, look. Is this, is this seven brain supersymmetric or non supersymmetric? No, it's not supersymmetric. Non -supersymmetric. Good. Yes, yes. So we looked then at the solution of the. Equation of motion in, uh, with 90 Poincare symmetry means really the back reaction of this stack. And then we, we, we revisit the singularities. We understood which kind of singularities are at the endpoints. Then we propose an ansatz for a seven brain solution. And we, we solve the equation of the motion with that ansatz. And we, we find that at the core of this seven brain, there is really the same kind of singularities at the end point of the interval. So this is why we believe that we found a good proposal for this seven brain. So actually, the situation is a bit more uh, uh, subtle because uh, the, the solution, the, the bulk solution, so the solution for the stack of anti da 8 in type 2A are three. There is a class, there are three different classes of solution, actually two, but one of them has two subclasses. Uh, and not Nicole, all of them, yes. Sorry to interrupt, can I ask a basic question? So the yes. so you're constructing a brain solution here, and from the looks of your solution, it looks like a static solution, right? Yes, uh, but the, is is it true that the, the um, that the Sugimoto on a circle doesn't admit like a static solution vacuum? I mean, Sugimoto itself has a has a dynamical tadpole, right? So the axidilaton yes. runs, uh, and in here we, I would guess the axidilaton on the circle would both run in time. Yes, like it's not a, it's not a vacuum. If if this is what you're asking, there is not the minimum of scalar potential. I, I was just asking: Is it true that the vacuum of this theory is time dependent? Ah, well, uh, I'm not sure on this level. A homogeneous configuration sure. is time dependent. Should be, I think, because it's not, it's not really, a, as you said, the scalar potential is like rolling. So yeah. the, the dilaton would be rolling. So yes, I, I'm not minimizing the dilaton in one point. Uh, okay. Um, so there are three classes, and two of them are actually not good if you want to give a, an interpretation in terms of dynamical coverage because the distance space time turns out to be infinite. So uh, in this case, we, we don't really know what how to give a physical interpretation to this. But one class, what we call two plus, uh, there is a sign which is flipping between these two classes. In this case, the solution has a finite interval. 
So these are very good starting points for giving a dynamical cobordism interpretation. Then the next step is to look for seven brain solutions. So the defects, which are at the end points of this finite size interval. We propose then these ansatz, which as Raf was saying, it breaks here the symmetry in this two-dimensional space. We find the solution of the equation of motion for these ansatz, and then we study the singularity at the core, and this is really the same kind of singularity as the one uh, at the end points of the interval. Moreover, we also checked these scaling relations I was mentioning here. So these two scaling relations, which are defining dynamical cobordism, and they, they are indeed satisfied in our setup. So we believe that this is really a good candidate for uh, uh, an explicit metric for the seven brain solution, which is uh, breaking this cobordism symmetry. Uh, this is non-supersymmetric because we are solving really non-supersymmetric uh, uh, equations of motion. And moreover, the... yes. No, okay. And moreover, the coupling to the dilaton in string frame is of this kind. So, and this at least to us was not known. So it, it's possibly a new non-supersymmetric brain in string theory. Of course, I mean, this is just one way to, to get to this object and to really have a solid confirmation what one would need multiple ways and independent ways to, to really have a confirmation of this object. But we believe this is a good starting point. Uh, a question I have, one question I have yes. is that I mean, when we talk about cobordism, we don't need to have a solution, of course. We just need to interpolate and, and study it. Whereas you seem to be emphasizing solutions a bit. And I'm a bit confused yes. because ultimately you cannot have a solution, which is Poincare invariant, because by definition, it's not stable. You just told us that it will roll. So it's not going yes. to mess up that. So I'm a bit confused. Why are we looking for solutions? Well, I am just looking at as, as, uh, the profile of the scalars which comes out from the equations of motion. But I mean, if you look at the, if, if, if you wanted to do that, then why don't you look at the time dependence of the rest of it? The, the solution is not, this is not a solution after all, as you know. So I'm a bit confused. What is the, what is it that you're aiming at? <clears throat> so Nicole, what we're aiming at is- The solution is not time dependent. Well, isn't there potential? I thought this is this breaks yes, yes. the symmetry or not? Yes, you are breaking the Poincare symmetry in particular, and in particular uh, by having this spontaneous compactification along this one direction that is still longitudinal to the brain. So either you, you can either in the original paper by Douglas Mora, there are two solutions. One was time dependent, so that this warp factor depends on time, and the other one is that the warp factor not the one that we are seeing now, the one for the eight brain uh, is depending on one of the longitudinal coordinates, which in this case is um, Y. <laughs> so it's sort of a con spontaneous compactification of one more dimension than you think that your brain has as, as isometries. But why are we, general? I mean, do you understand why we should be looking at solutions for the cobordism questions? Well, I, no, and I'm, I'm not, no, no, I think we're not saying you need to look for solutions, but the point I think, particularly of the Spanish group here is, that there are solutions known which have a behavior that is very reminiscent of what you guys proposed for the defects breaking the uh, the, the, the thing the thing that I, I find well I will tell you why I'm raising this question yeah. that Jake and I were most found it most uh, interesting were the objects we couldn't identify namely the ones which break supersymmetry and yeah. those are the ones that are not going to have easy solutions in the sense that you're going to have time evolution and all that. So uh, the point was was basically identifying the objects, not necessarily saying what happens to them or how stable they are. I mean, what happens to their fate or yeah. whatever. So so that's what I'm finding a little different, from, at least in the spirit of what we have, what we were doing. But then, yeah, I'll let you go on with it, the talk. So okay. actually, maybe, maybe I can say something about that. I mean, you, for the ones which are are, are not supersymmetric, right? Come on, we would we would not expect to have a supersymmetric solution. But I mean. They, they, they still carry some protected topological charge. So it's not completely unreasonable that there could be some sort of minimal configuration that they that they end up in, right? Because they, they can't decay to something that doesn't have that topological charge. Come on, I think you're muted if you're trying to say something. Space-time dependence of it is going to be different though, because it's not it's not super symmetric. It's not going to be Poincaré invariant. Anyhow, we, we can discuss it. Uh, so, so, sorry, can I maybe... I'm confused that with Kamran, are you saying that there cannot be any time independent solution? Yes. If you break supersymmetry, I don't think so. I mean, the, well, they're kind of metastable at this, I don't know. 
So all, all of your new uh, objects would be time dependent. You're saying Sorry, no if the bulk if the bulk is supersymmetric, you're fine. I guess you can you can have a situation where the bulk is supersymmetric and the brain is not supersymmetric. Is that what you're dealing with? In the Sugimoto model, yes, the bulk is okay. Okay, maybe, maybe then it's maybe it's, not as, the maybe it's not as dramatic. Okay, continue. I, I mean, this is very common, right? The the spinner in type one is a right. particle That's, excitation. If you're just if your if your geometry is not in the bulk, so if you, right. if you keep the whole thing supersymmetric except the boundary, then I don't have a problem. Okay. So so so, okay, sorry, so Nicola, I just I don't understand what you just said. I you said the bulk was supersymmetric. But the bulk far away from the membrane should go back to the Sugimoto vacuum, which is not supersymmetric, right? What am I missing? Sir, can you repeat it? Sorry? Sorry? The, bulk the, super the, the bulk in the Sugimoto model is supersymmetric. Supersymmetric the, the bulk of the the, the the bulk of the interval. I know the, of the interval. Of, of no, no, that's uh, no, that's a long. No, that's not supersymmetric. It's along the eight, uh, the, the the supersymmetry vacuum brain. Yes. So, so I think what Kumru meant by the bulk is like you have the end of the wall brain here, and then there's the interval, which is fiber. Yes. Or whatever. And I think he correct me, Kumar, if I'm wrong. You meant far away from the from the membrane, and the vacuum yes. far away from the membrane should be susy breaking, right? Yes. Because yes. the motor yes. vacuum is susy breaking. Yes. yes. Okay. It, it is true that in the ten-dimensional perspective, inside of a point in the interval, like if you look at it close in ten-dimensional perspective, locally, if you away from the D8 brain, it's locally supersymmetric, but you don't see that in the nine-dimensional perspective. Yes. So okay, just to understand. Eventually, you're saying all this solution must be time dependent somehow. Because it breaks supersymmetry and there is no way. Okay. Okay. I'm just yes. Then... Breaking supersymmetry uh, everywhere. I think. Okay. Good. Let, let me. Maybe we can discuss. Let me just go to the second part. Otherwise, I don't have time to finish this. So uh, now I will discuss something different. So gauging, I will go back to what Ralph said essentially for groups of the point, but I will generalize this to to groups of a generic manifold X. So the motivation to do this is essentially to to give further support to the conjecture also in these more general cases and actually to, to understand if there is a physical interpretation for these groups and uh, we, we find that at least in some example you can give a physical interpretation. Um, what one can said, say uh, already at the starting point just by using mathematical uh, ideas is that when you fix a manifold x the groups are enlarged. Um, Essentially, what happens is, is, that, is that you have um, additional contributions, which are really due to the fact that you fix the topology of X. So these groups are somehow intuitively uh, collecting uh, symmetries about topology. So if you fix the topology of X, you should expect more global symmetries. So what I'm denoting here with tildes are called reduced groups, and these are really there uh, to, to tell you that you are fixed. You have fixed the topology of X. An alternative way to think about this is by, by saying that when you fix X, you somehow are changing the original structure of, of the groups when you, look, when you look at the groups of the points. So these are more or less this two different ways to, to see the same thing. The physical interpretation that we propose, at least in some examples, in the example we computed, is that these groups, omega X and KX, are collecting all the information about the global symmetries when you are doing the dimensional reduction of the theory on X. So if you start from a d-dimensional theory or 10-dimensional theory, for example, for the groups of the point, then you, when you choose a, X to be a six-dimensional manifold, you will see in these groups how the symmetries organizes when you study the low-dimensional low effective field theory in four dimensions. So uh, I, have, I have a, yes. Can I ask to see if I understand that? So for instance, suppose that I take the case where I'm going from, let's say, type to be, uh, you know, from 10 dimensions to nine dimensions, and I'm compactifying on a circle, then uh, what, what confuses me is that the, the global symmetries of the theory after I do dimensional reduction depend on which fields I have before dimensional reduction. So for instance, if I do it for, for type 2b, I get uh, two vectors coming from the dimensional reduction of the b and c, uh, two forms of type 2b in 10 dimensions. But if I do it for type 2a, I just get uh, um, I, I just get I just get the, the nebulous source one, right? Yes. And the Galusak line. So, so why? My, my, my question is, is, is X alone and this construction supposed to tell us the symmetry type of the theory after we do a dimensional reduction? Or are we introducing also information about the physical theory somehow? In, uh, in the well, so we are not really able to compute these groups with gauge fields turned on. So if 
uh, what we we did is just to put like for example x to be calabi i will have an example in this case but no ramon of fits turn on so i will not see the demand. but so so the the symmetries that you're getting from this are just the symmetries coming from from the geometry or the geometry of the calabi yes i will see the betty numbers for the cycles of the calabi but the betting numbers themselves don't tell you what their symmetries are. You need to know which fields you're reducing from the high dimensional point of view, right? Well, I I will know. So there will be a formula in which each betting number is multiplied by a covariance group of the point. That group will tell me which symmetry I'm uh, is coming from uh, yeah. from the ten dimensional theory. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so here I have a few slides, uh, but I think I, since I'm short in time, uh, I should uh, I will try to to say this in in few words. So yeah, what I want to just to present the technique, the mathematical technique to do this computation, which is called the spectral sequence. Roughly, the idea is that you want to compute a generalized cohomology theory, like covariance of K theory, but you don't know how to do it directly. So you have to start from something you know, which is ordinary cohomology or homology. And then you refine this approximation by means of operations, which are called differentials. Eventually, one, once you are done with this step, this is not yet the end, uh, the end of the story because there might be yet an additional complication, which is called an extension problem. So uh, more precisely, a spectral sequence consists of pages and differentials. Pages have a number R, which is really the number of the page, and they have entries with indices P and Q. So this is a grid with entries, the cohomology groups, for example. And the logic is that the next page is the cohomology of the previous page with respect to that differential. And the idea is to go from one page to the next one by means of differentials. Eventually, you can end up with the last page, what is called infinity. So when you are finished with your differentials, and the result in the easy case would be just the sum over the diagonals of this page. However, typically this is not true because you have presence of torsional groups which uh, which uh, which complicate uh, this statement and what we used is a specific kind of, uh, of uh, spectral sequence which is called the PA is a spectral sequence so to give you an example this is how a second page might look like in simple cases I have only three sorry four known vanishing entries and all the rest is zero so the more zeros the easier usually the calculation Due to this very simple form, the only non-trivial differential, so a differential which doesn't start or end up in zero, is this one. Let's say that I know that this differential kills completely this entry, so you have a zero in the third page, and then due to the presence of all of these zeros, there is no third differential whatsoever. So from here, I should be able to read off the, the final result for the first level, so n equals zero, so this would be omega zero if I'm computing over this. The result is already this group. For omega one is the sum over this diagonal, which is zero. For omega two, however, there are two non-vanishing groups, which I'm calling A and B. And here is where the extension enters essentially, because the, the correct uh, answer is that omega two will be the extension of A by B. But unless I don't know what are A and B, I cannot in general say what is this extension. For example, if A and B are both Z, then the extension is Z plus Z. However, if A and B are torsion, for example, if they are both Z2, well, it is known that there are two possible extensions, like Z2 plus Z2 and Z4, and uh, the spectral sequence is not telling me which one to choose. So there is a, an interesting uh, difficulty here. So these are like mathematical steps, but uh, there are instances in which we can give a physical interpretation. I'm importing here an example of this. In the spectral sequence now for K theory, I encounter at a certain point a third differential D3 which is a mathematical operation called sterno square. And actually you can show that this sterno square is uh, roughly equivalent to the third integer stiffening with a class of, class of, of the manifold Y. Now it is known independently that this differential is vanishing. This implies that this manifold is spin C because vanishing of this class is really the spin C condition. And this can be really uh, given a physical interpretation due to the result by Friedman Witten, which says that Type 2D brains, so okay, theory is about type 2D brains. Type 2D brains must wrap a manifold Y, which is spin C, otherwise there is an anomaly. So somehow the spectral sequence is encoding automatically this information is actually encoding more because you can argue as in these papers that while the kernel is related to anomalies, the image 
which is there because I'm taking the cohomology with respect to the differential, the image is related to uh, unstable brains. So the, the spectral sequence already gives you, as a result, brains which are stable and uh, non anomalous. Okay, so now go, I go back to, to the result and do the physical interpretation. The interpretation we propose, as I said, is that these groups in certain cases can be understood in terms of the dimensional reduction of the theory on X. So the result, we computed these groups for specific so choices of manifolds. So I don't mean to be general here. What I'm saying only applies as far as I, for this talk, for these manifolds. The full result for both for K theory and for uh, cobordism can be actually recast in a simple form. So these groups are actually sum over the groups of the point with coefficient the Betty number. And we argue then in the paper, in explicit examples, that this pattern precisely reproduce what you would expect from dimensional reduction in onyx. In particular, this pattern reproduces how the symmetries in the d-dimensional theory, small d is the higher dimensional theory, behave when I consider them with respect to the lower dimensional theory, so d minus k. So to be a bit more specific, I will now discuss K theory and cobordism this uh, independently. And then I will show you how it is possible to play the same game as Ralph and Gage and reconstruct that force essentially. Nicola, one, so, one question yes. before you go on. So yeah, I'm trying to understand. So I mean, I, I think, how do you, how this picture is consistent with dualities? Because global symmetry is something physical that should not change of what is the duality frame. While X, like the manifold in which you are compactifying, is not something physical. We can have a theory on a different manifold and be equal to a different theory in a different manifold. So how come, uh, how is how is it possible that only for from the information of on X, you can derive what are what is the global symmetry? Well, I'm not sure. So the global symmetry in in the higher dimensional theory is given by the group of the point, right? What I'm seeing here is how this global symmetry can decompose when I choose to, to, to put my theory on a fixed background X, which is uh, by my choice, this is a consistent solution of the string theory equations of motion. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying more than this. How does it change if I now perform a duality, I change X, like the, in quantum gravity, you don't have a fixed topology. So what would happen then? Uh, good question. We we didn't look into that. So, uh, well, in, I mean, I think this is not the best starting point to answer that question because here X is really fixed. So, I mean, I'm fixing X from the beginning. That's fixed. I cannot uh, I cannot change it. So I cannot see changing in the changes in the topology of X from here. So somehow. So you, I think, should do something else than this. Yeah, so I'm just never see... going to be like the cobordism of the quantum gravity theory. No, no, no. Actually, we are taking a step far. You know, we are going in the opposite direction because here I'm putting more fixed topology while you would like to, to somehow uh, fluctuate over all the topology, right? Here I'm somehow fixing a part in the topology which is not going to change ever uh, until the end, essentially. And this is why I'm getting all of these contributions. While uh, the point of considering the groups of the point is that uh, you don't really want to have a fixed topology which is automatically generating global symmetries okay yeah so then one has to this is the first step no one then has to change it for yes i mean if you then want to go back to quantum gravity and to get a zero group then you have to go in the reverse direction here i'm going in if you want in the wrong direction to get a zero cover this group because essentially since x as an trivial topology this will be non-zero in general but this was to understand really uh, how much we can dig into this conjecture and how much this will make sense uh, in a, at a physical level. So under dimensional reduction or standard operation we perform on effective theories. Maybe I can ask a, a, a clarifying question that might help for this point. Um, you're not saying that this thing you compute here is the cobordism charges of the lower dimensional theory. If I understand you correctly, these are the the, you're saying that the theory in D dimension, higher dimensions had some global symmetry given by cobordism charges. You reduce it on a fixed frozen X and you get some global symmetry in the lower dimensional theory, but they're not cobordism charges of the lower dimensional theory. They're just some global charge. Uh, um, I, what do you mean by cobordism charge in the lower dimensional theory? How would you define those? 
I, I mean, the lower dimensional theory is some is some theory of quantum gravity, and it it makes sense on certain spaces, and those spaces have their own cohortism. Uh, okay, so these I mean, this is maybe a bad example to give, but one example would be you know, F theory looks like a twelve dimensional theory. You put it on a torus, um, and then you get cohortism, you get spin C cohortism in type two B because the torus fiber can move around and can even degenerate. But here you're freezing the fiber, you're freezing the the internal manifold. Um, and these charges are just some global charge that can be carried by, by, by objects in this theory, but the objects do not look like non-trivial topology in the lower dimensional theory necessarily. No, not necessarily, I think, yes. Yeah. I think I agree with this, yes. But in this way, I see where do they come, where do they come from in the higher dimensional theory, essentially. can really spot each uh, direction. Okay, so. The results now, uh, K first K theory, very briefly, because it's uh, more intuitive, then the covertism interpretation is a bit more subtle. So for K theory, we have a sum over the groups of the point, and we know that these groups are really co-dimension N plus M brains. And in this case, we, we, we understand that they wrap a K minus M cycle of X. So this is what one expects from dimensional reduction. And actually, as I showed you before, since we are using a technique which is automatically implementing anomaly constellation, we, we, we are sure that these brains are stable and non anomalous. And also, all the possible sites are allowed by the topology of X are in general topology. For cobordism, the situation is a bit trickier. In particular, if, you want, if we want to play the same game as before with tuples. So, if you want to understand how a 10 dimensional tuple propagates in the lower dimensional theory, the reason is the following. Uh, you see that here I'm splitting the index of the cobordism group into n plus k, where this n is really the same index of the k theory groups. So this index n plus k has to be positive because it's a dimension of a manifold, so it cannot be negative. But now I can have situations in which n is negative, but still the sum with k is positive. And I have to distinguish between these two cases. The first case, which is the easier to give a physical interpretation, is when n is actually positive by itself. In this case, the would be corresponding k theory group uh, related by this uh, Atiyah Sapiro map as correctly a negative index here. So we have a meaningful physical interpretation in terms of brain. So, and so we can play the same game with brain sources and cover this invariance. In this case, in the second case, instead, uh, for some values of n, this index will become positive. And so there is no really uh, brain interpretation in, in physics, uh, and uh, somehow the mechanism seems to break. But in one example we discussed, we have a proposal for, for giving a, a physical interpretation also to these groups. So they will also contribute to that course in a bit of a different way. So let me give them the example, uh, one example at length, which is X to be Calabiao. Um, and here I'm showing you the results for omega six and K zero upstairs. So this is a sum of the group of the points for K theory and cobalt is with coefficient the Betty number. These groups with different colors, they originate uh, from different higher form symmetries in the 10 dimensions, but they will all contribute to the same three, four symmetry in, uh, in, the, in the lower dimension of theory. And then since I have a one-to-one -one correspondence between cobaltism and K theory groups, I can really pair them as Ralph did before for the groups really of the point. And for each of these different colors, I can construct a different tuple essentially. So the logic is, is the same as before. We take the cobalt uh, Sorry to so, interrupt, so, just, just so yes, you yes, know, yes, yes. Uh, we've already hit the one hour threshold. So okay, then I will be very fast now. So the logic is the same as before. Could, could uh, I take before, the... Sorry, Nicola, before, is, is it okay if I ask a quick question? Yes. Yeah, so, so in the examples that you had before, it was all without torsion, right? And, and Ralph was yes. mentioning before that sometimes the torsion charges do not appear in tadpoles. Um, if you look at non-torsion uh, cases where, which don't have torsion, actually K-theory is the same as cohomology. It's going to be the yes. same as cohomology. So, yes. so, so yeah, how do you expect these changes when, when you introduce space? We look at more interesting spaces. Uh, good question. We, we, it, it should change, but in general, we don't know. It's, uh, it's something we, we, we try to understand, but uh, we, we don't have a complete answer. But, but, but the, the discrete, do you expect that discrete, if you have something like a Z2 here, is going to be an adaptable or not? Or? Uh, well, it, it, it is going to probably appear in the tadpole, but I, 
I cannot give a definite answer. Also, uh, with torsion, with, it's not really easy to play this game when uh, then here eventually we expand in homology. But with torsion, these invariants they don't have like a local expression typically, for example. But, but, invariant. I, but I thought in the uh, first part of the talk, Ralph had an example where the where the where the, the, the discrete guy did not appear in that pool. Yes. Uh, we do, okay, the answer is that we don't know in general. So in the okay. paper, we, we worked out the exam, fully the example without torsion. Okay, torsion, we didn't consider it. Okay, so the logic is, as I was saying, you for each of these groups, you can really reconstruct tap poles in the lower dimensional theory. Uh, and essentially, okay, from the first level, you have just one tap pole because it's well, just one betting number here. The second level, you have more tuples. Uh, you can construct the tuple by combining K theory and cobordism, and then you expand in homology to, to, to really see the tuple in the lower dimensional theory and so on. Now, since I'm running out of time, let me briefly mention the fate of this lower dimensional group, and then I will conclude. So these groups for these values of N, they don't have a corresponding K theory group in, in general. So we were, we're not really sure how to give a physical interpretation in terms of caging. So we propose the following just for Calbiao now. What I said before can work also for the other spaces we consider, but this I'm going to say now is really only for Calabiao. We propose that for Calabiao, the lower dimensional group, so when the index is less than six, the dimension of the Calabiao, if the index is odd, this is broken because there is no gauge field in the theory to gauge it. While if the index is even, it can be gauged, there is a gauge field. And we, we try to give a physical interpretation for this. So we, what we did is that we brought down a table like this. In the first line, there are all the groups I discussed in the example before with the same colors, essentially. So this we understood. For this, there is a corresponding K-theory group. So we can really reconstruct the tuple with K-theory sources. These are the groups we are not sure how to, to interpret physically, but if we look at them, we see that, for example, omega-4 will contain an omega-0 contribution. This is associated, associated to a C8, which is the same C8 as here. So we propose that this contribution is a new contribution to the red color tuple here, essentially. And this contribution is a localized offset. The same is, is true for uh, this other contribution, <clears throat> where now it's a C6 tuple, a C4 tuple, and so on. So we are able to give a physical interpretation for all of this line. Also for this object, which is somehow uh, not localized, but is a smear contribution coming from the Sir Simon section of these objects. And then since we have a, a systematic classification, so these are all the possible contribution in, in this example, sim very simple example, but these are all the possibilities. Since we have a physical interpretation for this and for this, then there should be a physical interpretation for this. So this is want our proposal. There should be new contributions to some C6 tuple and C4 tuple in string theory in certain setups in which the contribution is a C1 of some four dimensional manifold or a C2 uh, first cell plus of a two dimensional manifold. But okay, this is very much speculative. This was really the, the, the last uh, part of, of the paper. We again, as for the seven brain solution, we need uh, for sure an independent confirmation. Anyway, the message is that perhaps even gauging can can give you new predictions. I think this, if you want the, the lesson from from this kind of analysis. So to conclude, uh, these works were all, all based on the fact that in quantum gravity there should be no global symmetries, and this uh, simple idea is, is seems to be true also also when you generalize the notion of symmetry. So when uh, when you consider, for example, covariance symmetry, and actually this idea has predictive power. Uh, we showed that uh, dynamical cobordism is a particular way to realize this idea. And it, it can actually predict new objects which can possibly be captured by supergravity. And also we showed that you can combine cobordism and K-theory in order to reconstruct certain tuples in tech one and tech two P uh, string theory. And further, we, we, we tried, we did a first step in understanding these more general groups uh, in simple cases uh, for simple enough manifold we are, we are able to compute. As future directions, uh, for sure, there is the generalization to depth way or M theory, which I didn't cover at all. And of course, it, at the technical level, it would be very nice to compute more, uh, more interesting groups. So the groups I, I was computing uh, were boring eventually because as we said, there was no torsion whatsoever, and the structure was, was very simple. So the, the true challenge would be to, to improve uh, on this, uh, this point. 
And since we, we are able to, uh, with this logic, one is able to give new predictions, of course, this new prediction must be confirmed uh, independently. So with possibly uh, other methods rather than just cover this more supergravity analysis. And eventually what I, I think it would be very interesting is to perhaps completely clarify the origin of tadpoles in general and to have a purely bottom-up derivation of the tadpole. So even these coefficients that uh, Ralph was mentioning, which are left uh, uh, unknown or free in our uh, in our proposal for the moment it will be very good i think if one is able to give a first principle derivation without using L, really any string theory input because then this could really provide a new uh, way to address the, the question about the string lampos principle thank you for your attention